Father, there is no doubt about it. We need to be in your presence. We want to be in your presence. We don't want to run away from you. There are times in our lives, Father, where we, uh, we make a mess of it and we're not all that we ought to be or could be. And there are times like that, Father, that we, we try to distance ourselves. But we know in our heart and in our soul know that you've called us in the middle of all of our stuff. You don't call us, Father, because we've got it all worked out. You call us in the middle of our junk uh, that David talked about earlier. Father, you've called us uh, through all of that, and we're thankful for it. So we're asking for you this morning as we seek your presence in our worship time together, Father, and we know that you've been here, that you are here. We ask for you to surround us. We ask for that spirit to fill us, to be poured out upon us, even as as Taylor said in some opening remarks this morning, we, we ask for that and we want that. And I ask, Father, for you to just be with us. Thank you for the sweet, precious fellowship that is ours uh, as your chosen people. All this we hold up to you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen, y'all. Isn't it good to be together? You know, I want to tell you one of the things that, that pops into my mind. I got to thinking about this as we were uh, worshiping today. And uh, really thought about it during that special song that the praise team led. Man, that, I don't know about you guys, that really blessed my life. It really did. And uh, even though I didn't know the words and I wasn't actually singing that, I was participating in that just like everybody else was. That was a beautiful, uh, beautiful song and a beautiful notion uh, that as we come before God. And it, the thought popped into my head how um, no matter what kind of week I'm having, sometimes I have really good weeks, y'all, most of the time. And sometimes they're really crummy. And, and it's not that I've had a crummy week this week. I'm just telling you the thought that popped into my head. It seems like no matter what kind of week I have, when I come together here with all of y'all and we worship together, uh, and we sing together, we pray together, we look into the Word together, uh, we laugh together sometimes, we cry together sometimes, we applaud together, and at other times it's that together thing. When we do that, I find myself being renewed, I think, by the Spirit of God. That, that's really what worship is, is, is all about. And that's what I want us to experience, really, when we come together. You know what? Sometimes I feel like I'm a... Uh, here's, I, ought, I ought to be careful about the things that I say that pop into my head. But sometimes I feel like a big old huge whale just lumbering down the, you know, in the ocean here. And I feel like at times I'm traveling under pack ice. Uh, and, 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 and so here, maybe, maybe, maybe that's not a bad picture, right? And then I come to an air hole. About every seven days, I come to an air hole, cut through that pack ice in this frozen, cold world that we live in, and that air hole is worship. And we come together and we connect with each other as the kingdom, as God's chosen people, and we connect with Him. Worship is an important part. Now, I, I want to tell you honestly, there is in Christendom at large uh, a pretty strong movement afoot to separate uh, a relationship with God to your relationship with church. There's, a, there's a, an observable bunch of folks called nuns. Have you ever heard of them? Uh, I'm not talking about nuns, N-U-N-S, but I'm talking about nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Like church affiliation, and they check the box, none. Still have a sense that they are uh, believers in Jesus, and they love Jesus, and they want to serve in whatever way. But the idea that church is a part of that just doesn't really come into play. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm just, all I'm saying is, is there it is. My notion is, you know why I'm here today, really, honestly? Same reason most of you guys are here today. It's because of what I believe. It's, it's what I believe about life, what I believe about death, what I believe about eternity, what I believe about God, what I believe about sin or my junk, if you don't want to call it sin, it's my junk, the mistakes, the horrors that I, <laughs> rolls through my brain. I, I, I just... I, Worship's when we come together. Worship's when we, when we, a lot of that just gets satisfied. Worship is when, is when something happens and we, and we really connect with God. I'm here because I believe what I believe. You're here because you believe. And, and church is a key part of that belief because there's a notion in Scripture. It goes from beginning to end. If I had to say, here's a good, clear theme of the Bible, Old and New Testament alike, here's what it is. It's the idea of chosen. It's the idea of the elect. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, you guys. Honestly, I don't. I just mean it the same way the text would mean it. There's a group of people that have accepted the call of God. 
And they are the elect of this world. They are the chosen of this world, chosen by God. We become chosen when we answer that call. And that's a theme all the way through. And here's the thing about it. Whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, whether it involves a single person or a group of people or whatever it is, chosenness, chosenness is important. And chosenness is who God calls all of us to be. And it happens when you answer the invitation, when you answer God's invitation, when you answer his call. There are certain characteristics, no matter Old Testament or New, certain characteristics of it that's true about being chosen. That's what we're going to look at this morning. You guys with me? And to do that, let's go back to a really primitive call. In fact, let's go back to the very first call. We're going to have a history lesson this morning, all right? And we're going to take a look at some very foundational kinds of stuff and hopefully connect a lot of things that we've been talking about all year, all right? So let's go back to the book of beginnings, the book of beginnings, chapter 12, all right? Some of, okay, I see some of you kind of, okay, you know what I'm talking about. Others of you may not know. It's the book of Genesis, right? Genesis means beginning. So let's go to Genesis chapter 12, the very first time that idea of chosen ever appears in Scripture, where the call of God goes out for the very, very first time. We're going to learn some things there. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 18. Genesis written by a guy named Moses, right? He's not, his name is not in the text anywhere. There. It doesn't say Genesis by Moses, right? But traditionally, that's the guy that wrote that, and Jesus verifies that tradition, right? He talks about the books of Moses. He's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch, Penta means five, first five books of the Old Testament, he penned it. And Genesis is a book about the beginning of everything, right? Most of us in here know that, but it's a book about beginnings of, of everything. Everything we see, everything we know, everything we experience, everything we imagine, it has its beginning spot in Genesis, The cosmos, the stars, the moons, the planets, this earth, the fish, the animals, mankind, all of it has, the book of Genesis talks about those beginnings. Now just kind of as a sidebar, because it's not really what I want to talk about this morning, but I want you to understand before, and sometimes folks get all divided about, about how some of those beginning things occur, just keep this in mind. The book of Genesis is not a scientific document. It's not a document about the science of creation. It is a document that is a theological explanation, not only of how we got here, but why we're here. That's really the important part. It's about why we're here. Why? That's the big question in life. That's the one that I struggle with all the time. I know you do as well. Why? Why this? Why? It's the answer. Why? Why are we here? God did it, but but why? That's the real issue in all that, right? So he talks about mankind, and he talks about cultures, and he talks about societies. God inspiring this through Moses. And he talks about the table of nations. What a huge chapter that is. A lot of times if you're doing your daily Bible reading, you come to the table of nations and you say, I don't want to read all that. And so you kind of skip over it. There's some pretty significant stuff going on in the table of nations. First 11 chapters of Genesis uh, cover thousands of years. Really, literally. And if you're going to look at the book of Genesis, you can divide it up into two parts. Chapters 1 through 11 and the rest of it. All right. So here he talks about all this stuff and how it begins. And then you come to chapter 12, and that's where this central theme of Scripture pops up for the very first time. It's the idea of being chosen. Right? Are we the chosen people of God? Anybody that's accepted the invitation of Jesus Christ, we're chosen, right? We've answered the call. Here's where it first begins to appear, and what is characteristically true of that call is true of the idea of chosenness all the way through Scripture. We okay? We okay? We're going to look at some foundational stuff here. So let's look at chapter 12. It's a call. Here's where it started with a guy named Abraham, right? His name is Abram here. He doesn't get his name changed until chapter 17 when he goes into a kind of covenant relationship with God involving circumcision and all of that. We're not here to talk about that. But here's the call. You guys ready? The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. All right? There it is, just a very few words. But there is, like the central theme of people and our relationship to God and our relationship to the world, it's captured right there. Two key words, leave and go. Foundation of being chosen. We leave somewhere and we go And we go somewhere. He said, here, go to a land I'll show you. Imagine the faith required. 
Here's that voice from God, and God says, leave and go, leave your home, leave your people, leave everything you know, everything, ah, that's not an easy thing. Leave it all, leave it all, and go, and I'll, and I'll tell you where that, I'll tell you where that is now. There's a promise. Hang on to that leave and go. Underline that in your Bible if you want to, because we're going to come back to that in just a couple of minutes. But he also has a promise associated with it, a promise that reaches right down, it reaches right down to you, right now. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, the chosen one. You and I enjoy that blessing right now. We're children of Abraham. That's what Paul calls us. We're children, we're of the nation, the spiritual Israel. That's who we are. By faith, he says in the book of Romans, is where he really develops that idea. So here you are. Here we are. Chosen people. It starts right there with Abraham, and you and I are still being blessed today because of that. Now, you know what? He answers that call. Verse 4, so Abram left as the Lord had told him. And that's it. He became chosen when he answered that invitation. And chosenness continues to bless us. Now, it doesn't go into a lot of detail here. I just want you to kind of appreciate what this guy went through. I want you to imagine here a big map. Let's, uh, this over here, this screen over here, this is going to be uh, uh, oh, the Fertile Crescent. Fertile Crescent is going to say runs right up here. And this is where Babylon, ancient Babylon was right down here. You know where Abraham was when he got this call? He was in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, right? And it's right down about right here, okay? Euphrates is where the Garden of Eden probably was, people speculate, because the Tigris River is there and the Euphrates River is there and all that kind of stuff. It's called the Fertile Crescent, kind of the birthplace of, of life, all right? So here it is. He's in Ur of the Chaldees. The Promised Land, he didn't know where it was, but it's all the way, we'll call this the Promised Land, okay? Right over here, this void, this empty spot over here, that's the Mediterranean Sea. You don't go over there, all right? You get really, really whoa, wet. So that's the sea. Here's the Promised Land, and he's way over here. Now, he could have just, when God called him, God, why didn't God just lead him? Because actually where he's winding up is right over here. He could have gone straight across. But see, that would have been tough because right here where the baptistry is and this screen is right here, that's the Arabian Desert. And back in those days, they traveled camels and donkeys and horses and flocks and herds and people. And you just can't, you just can't go across the desert like that, right? So here's what he did. And you can follow his path by uh, looking at Scripture. But he starts off in Ur of the Chaldees, and he heads in kind of, a, kind of a northeasterly direction all the way up to a spot called, kind of think about sort of on the right-hand side of that top of that middle screen, there's this town up there called Haran. And above that, where the ceiling is, that's the Hittite Empire. The Bible talks about the Hittites over and over. Didn't really know they really had no evidence of their existence until a few years ago. But that's where the Hittite Empire was. So he comes to Haran, and then he turns, and he starts heading in the south easterly direction, right, just kind of like this, he kind of gets across here, crosses the Euphrates River in Haran, comes down and starts going right down through the middle of the promised land, God's showing all, all of it. He doesn't get over to the Mediterranean Sea, he's over here, here, right here where this little crease is, that would be, that would be the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, y'all got the pick? How come y'all looking at me like that? You know what I'm talking about, right? So he comes all the way down here. He's still on his journey, right? So he sees the promised land. And then he heads due east and runs right smack off the Sinai Desert through that. Goes into Africa, a place called Egypt. And he has a run-in with Pharaoh down there because Sarah was a good-looking woman. Did y'all remember that in the Old Testament? And she had, Abraham had problems with her because with two different kings. One of them was Pharaoh, king of Egypt, right? So he had a problem with him. God continued to bless Abraham Pharaoh, through, through Pharaoh, he blessed him. He blessed him in all kinds of ways. So he turns around, heads back through Egypt, comes up into the promised land, and settles in a place called Bethel. And he begins to live in a place called the Oaks of Mamre. It's in the hill country, a beautiful, beautiful spot. On the southern end of the hill country, he establishes himself, puts his tents up. That's his herds. That's sort of home base, the Oaks of Mamre. Mamre, when... Abraham first went there. It was the name of a dude. It became the name of a city in an area, but it was the name of a man, and Abraham met this man. He was an Amorite. 
He lived over there in the promised land. He was one of the, the, there was all kinds of tribes, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and all this kind of stuff. Mamre was a, an Amorite. And, and uh, uh, Abraham settles right there in that spot. All right? Now skip over to chapter 18, verse 1, just for a second. He's sitting out here, according to chapter 18, verse 1. He's sitting one day in the heat of the day in front of his tent there at the Oaks of Mamre. And three fellows walk up. And the text says, that's the Lord. Now, wait a minute, the Lord is one, right? So what's there, three guys? Don't overdo that. If you're a word collector, that's an anthropomorphism, if you've never heard of it before. That's a term used to describe how it is that God manifests himself to people. He does it in terms that we can understand. Because if he just came down in his unguarded form, it'd blow all of us away. And not anybody in here could really stand up to that, right? So he comes in the form of, of three men. Now, they've got a mission. Part of their mission is to give message to Abraham. Another part of their message is, message is to deal with a couple of pretty wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? We're not going to go into a lot of detail of that. But here are those guys. Now, before we go any further with that, I want you to realize who this is sitting here in front of his tent that day in the heat of the day, minding his own business. This is a guy who's a stranger in that land. His people aren't there. His family's not there. Nobody's there. God has blessed him, to be sure. But, but there he is sitting out in front of his tent. He doesn't belong there. His roots aren't there. None of it. He's there because God called him. God said, leave and go. And he left and he went. And there he sits. There he is. Now, here's the deal. Here's the first notion about being the chosen person of God. It's in the DNA of this whole arrangement. It's this. Chosen people have some place to go. Now, hang on to that. Whether it's Abraham or it's Jesus or whoever it is, we got some place to go. We're not here to stay we're here to go. And actually, rather than saying some place to go, what I ought to say is, it is our, it's, our, it's our business to be about the business of going. Go to other peoples. Uh, somebody's saying, yeah, there he is slipping that in about our vision and stuff again all over again. Yeah. Tricky old Mark. I can't put anything over on you guys. It's all about evangelism. No, you know what it's about? It's about being chosen. It's about who the chosen people of God are. We are people that go to other people. By the way, Abraham was what nationality? Anybody? Oh, I'm scaring you, but what, who? Anybody know? He was a... <laughs> Hebrew. He was a Chaldean. I don't know what to say much after that, but when you look in chapter... F <laughs> Hebrew, okay? When you look in chapter 14 and verse 13 in the book of Hebrews, a uh, book of G Hebrews, book of Genesis, for the very first time, Abraham is called something. He's called Abram the Hebrew. Now, that's not the same thing as saying Abram the Jew or Abram the German or Abram the Russian. This was Abram the Hebrew. You know what the word Hebrew means? Crosser. Somebody who crosses over. It wasn't a description of a nationality. It was a description that the Amorites and Hittites and Perizzites and all these guys, Canaanites gave to Abram, gave to Abraham. He's known as the river crosser. He came from the other side of the river. What river? Euphrates. He ain't one of us. He's not one of us. He's other than we are. And he became an established man there in that other, with those other folks. But they're cro listen, I want you to know something. If you are chosen by God, you're a river crosser. You have crossed over. Well, what do you mean? Well, out of darkness into light. Paul talks about that. Out of, life into de out of death into life. Paul also talks about that. But here's the deal. From, from, from just being here to being out there. It's the nature of being chosen. Right. Jesus nails that down. Remember what he said in John 17? He's praying in John 17. And the heart of that prayer is unity of all believers. He's not just talking about our unity inside this room. right? Unity of believers. And then he says, and he talks about, he prays about his disciples. He prays about those that are going to come. That is, he prays about you and me in, that, in John 17. And he says, as you have sent me, I am sending them. Did you, did you catch that? Jesus was the chosen one of God. Right? And God sent him from his home to here. 
And he says, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending them. That's John 17, verse 18. Chapter 18, it all begins. The end's the beginning of the end, right? He's, he's handed over to the hands of his enemy. Or actually, he walks. He gives himself up to the enemy. He's mocked some crazy trial. He's beaten. He's beaten with a whip. He's crucified until, die, until he dies, and then he's buried in a tomb. Three days later, he arises. And guess what? The first thing is that he says to his disciples when he meets up with them. This is in John chapter 20 and verse 21. What's the first thing he says? First thing he says is, peace be with you. He said, I don't want you to be scared to death. Because you think, because I did, I know. But here I am. So peace be with you. Don't worry about this. Then here's the next thing. Here's the very next thing. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Part of being chosen means, folks, we're on the move. We're with other people. It's in our DNA. It's our spiritual DNA. Now, here's the second thing about being chosen. It means we got some. Pl- it means we got something to do, not just some place to go, but we have something to do. Now, I need to kind of hurry this up. So, take a look here just for a second. Let's go back to let's go back to Genesis 18. Got three guys there. It's the Lord. They got a dual mission. First mission is to say to Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. You're going to have a baby. That's part of that promise. You're going to be a great nation and all of that. He'd only had one child since then. That was Ishmael, right? And he thought that was going to be the promised child. God says, that's not it. It's going to be with Sarah. The incredible thing is, Sarah's 89 years old in Genesis 18. And Abraham is 99 years old. You know why that is? So it removes all doubt. It wasn't just by a natural process. It was the hand of God. It was the hand of God that did that. And it would take the hand of God. If Karen turns 89 and she winds up pregnant, she's got murder in her eye. I promise you. It's going to be by the hand of God only. Sarah laughed when she heard the news, right? She says, am I going to have you got to be kidding me? There's a quite an exchange between the three men and, and Sarah there, but we're not here to talk about that. So here's what happens next. They're getting ready to leave. They've given the message to Abraham. They're getting ready to leave. And Abraham's walking them out to the car, so to speak. Of course, they didn't have cars, but he was sending them off, sending them away. And he says here in about verse 17, this is where it really gets interesting. This is my best feature right here. You guys like that? Let me turn back around. These men get up. Abraham walks them out, verse 16. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham was surely, and of course, Abraham can hear this, right? It was for his benefit, actually. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him. Why? So that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Make him a great nation. Why? Because Abraham's got a job to do. To teach what is right and what is just. To guide into the way of God. I want to tell you, that is still the mission of the chosen. Still the mission of the chosen. Hadn't changed a single, solitary bit. Chosen is not just for you. Chosen is for everybody else. I, you, the reason we're talking about this today is because I want us to get a good, broad view, really, of our legacy and history, eternal history, God's history. We're, 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 we're called to be a blessing to everybody else, right? The business of choosing in Scripture is so that everybody else gets blessed as we do what we're here to do. Imagine you're in a cave. You've got any spelunkers in here? Oh, we're all smart people in here. I didn't always used to be smart. I used to spelunk quite a bit. So who, really, unless something goes wrong. Imagine you're spelunking in a cave, and there's a cave in, and there's only one way out. It's sort of a narrow little passage, and, and you can't move all the stuff because water's rising. I mean, I, can write a, I'm a, I could write a good TV series. So, so, so the water's rising. Somebody needs to get through there, and so you guys choose somebody that can wriggle through that hole and get out so that they can bring help for everybody else that's in the cave, right? Choosing is not just so that one person can be okay while everybody else drowns under there. This is an instrumental choice where one is chosen. 
to save all the others. That is the DNA. It is inherent in this business of being chosen. Are you a chosen child of God? I'm going to tell you something right now. You've got a divine destiny, but you've got a divine mission as well. I, I want to tell you right now, it's in our DNA to go <laughs> and to do the things and to say the things and to be the things that draws a lost world to a God that has a promise that he's trying to fulfill that he established ever since Genesis chapter 12. That's our legacy. Now, here's the really, here's the really good part. Uh, I'm going to go about two minutes over. Is that okay? What are you all going to do? Say, no, it's not okay. <laughs> but here it is. Here's the best part. The chosen people of God, this is, by far, this is the best part. Yeah, there's all that going to it. But here's the best part. You have a relationship to explore. The chosen can have a relationship with the chooser like nobody else. The called get to have a relationship with the caller. Now, look at this, and we need to do this kind of quickly here, right? Because I'm, I'm taxing you guys with my, my time here. So here we are. Look at verse, verse 20. Two of those three guys peel off, and they go down to Sodom and Gomorrah because the Lord has heard an outcry, and I'm going to see if it's really as bad as all of that. Did, could he know? Well, sure, he could know that, but that was for Abraham's benefit, right, for him to hear all of that. And later on in chapter 19, where all that happens, those two are referred to as angels. I don't know the difference sometimes between an angel of the Lord and the Lord. They seem to be interchangeable in the Old Testament. But that's another stuff we can talk about another time. Do that in your Bible class. So here we go. Those guys leave, verse 22. But well, look at verse 22. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. You know what that is? It's posture of prayer. Prayer is people and God in, co in, in communication. And I want to tell you, that's where things change. And you're not the only one that changes. God changes his mind. He changes his mind. Now look at this. He stands before the Lord. So verse 23, Abraham approached him and said, because remember the deal is he's going to go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's worried about that because his nephew Lot lives down there. So Abraham said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You know what he's doing? He's exploring. He thinks he knows this God. They've had several conversations, prayer. He's done a lot of things with God already. God's blessed him. But all of a sudden, here's something that pops up, and he's wondering, ooh, what is he really like? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Would you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked Treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Think about that. Here's a man of compassion arguing with the God who made him a man of compassion. Here's a man of compassion who's made in the image of this judge of all the earth. And he's saying, are you really going to do that? The Lord said, verse 26, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Who is this? This is the judge of all the earth. And you know what he does? He listens. He listens to the personal, private appeals of the chosen. Don't let the blessing of being chosen get past you on this now. So Abraham spoke up again, verse 27. Well, now that I've been so bold so as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, look at his attitude. What if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? Oh, if I find 45 there, he said, I'll not destroy it. So once again, he spoke to him, verse 29. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I'll not do it. And then he said, well, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And Abraham said, well, now that I've been so bold so as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I'll not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham returned home. I got an idea that God left checking his pockets. How about you? Sounds like something going down in Mexico, doesn't it? Well, I'll give you eight pesos for that hat. Well, no, how about six? And 
That's not what's really going on. There's not haggling going on here. You know what's going on? Exploration. Here's a picture of what prayer, what prayer really is. Does this look like your prayer? I don't have God really talking about it. Let me tell you, let me tell you, prayer is God communicating himself to you as well. And here's where it comes about. Here's where it changes. Now, it's also our weakest spot, you guys. We don't do a lot of time. We don't spend a lot of time in prayer. We, we might be all about the going, and we might be all about the doing, and we might be all about this and all about that because life's full of stuff, right? But prayer is not the, you know, i tell you what, we're like the city of Los Angeles is what we're like. I'm going to tell you something's going to happen in Los Angeles today. They're going to have water leaks in Los Angeles today. The underground water system, 27% of it's 100 years old or older. And they got breaks going on all the, all the time. 2009, they had a sinkhole pop up, and an entire fire truck, Los Angeles Fire Department fire engine, fell down in a sinkhole, busted water lines everywhere. And people said, hey, we've got to do something about this. Well, so, you know, there's not a lot of money in California. Have you all noticed that? Have you heard about that? They don't have a lot of money over there. But no problem, because see what's underground is underground. You don't look at it all that much, right? So it kind of calmed down, and everybody sort of went on about their way. Listen, you know what happened three months ago? July of 2014. A 30-inch water main, it runs along Sunset Boulevard, right next to UCLA campus. 30-inch water main erupted. It was 90 years old, the water main. It just erupted. It spilled out 8 to 10 million gallons of water before they could shut it off. It took them about four hours to do it. It flooded athletic fields. It's right there by UCLA. The Pauley Pavilion uh, got flooded. The, there, there were under, you know, underground parking garages filled with cars. They got flooded. <laughs> All this stuff everywhere. And everybody said, well, we've got to do something about that. We've got to do something about that. Well, there's no way, given their current rate of repair, that they can even keep up with it. But nobody, it's just kind of like, well, okay, just out of sight, out of mind. And yet it's the, it's the life source. Don't let that describe you. Our life source is Him. God's power is not poured out. His Spirit is not poured out on our plans. It is not poured out on the things that we do. It's not poured out on our organization. It's poured out on people of the Spirit. It's poured out on the people of God who go to Him in prayer. That's where it is. I don't know how you are in your walk. I'm asking our elders and their wives if they can kind of go to the back. And as we sing... If you need to come to him in prayer, you got special things going on. There's certain needs that you might have. Then, then let that be known to our elders and their wives as they, as they go to the back and as we stand and say. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful. and mercy to all, and He promises strength for the journey, to the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, faithful, faithful Lord, let us be faithful, faithful Lord, though we cannot see. Hey.
faithful.